Welcome to Massey College and welcome to this series on ethical leadership. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is built on indigenous land, the land of the Yorunwendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge their stewardship of the land and also express our gratitude for the ability that we have to continue to do our work here and today to discuss ethical leadership. The inspiration for this series is the celebration of the junior fellows at Massey College. There are graduate and professional students from all walks of life, all demographics from around the world and from different disciplines. And they are at Massey College because they believe in the mission of the college to nourish learning and serve the public good. We know that they will be leaders in their own field. We can predict that some will lead businesses, academic departments, law firms, political parties maybe, certainly NGOs, and many others. Massey wants to equip them with the tools for success and also the capacity to self-reflect on the responsibility that being successful brings. Hence the series on ethical leadership. Last year, we had the first session on ethical leadership and community with thoughtful contributions from indigenous scholar, Tracy Lindbergh, disability advocates, now deceased, Christine Carza, Ontario Court of Appeal judge, Michael Tullock, scientist, Molly Sochet, and philosopher, Daniel Weinstock. We learned a lot. And this year, I think we prom promised to have an equally interesting and stimulating discussions on ethical leaderships. I want to thank the sponsors for this series, Peter Lewis, Tim Casgrain, Ian Waddell, and Rene Sorel. And I also want to thank Public Policy Chair Tom Axworthy for setting up this series for this year. I hope you enjoy it. Well, um, good morning and uh, Thanks to all our viewers for joining in. As our principal has said, this is the first of a series on uh, whether ethics matters in today's society. Um, we know through the COVID epidemic that uh, each of us have to make a series of personal decisions um, that uh, have their background in our ethical principles. And ethics applies to all uh, elements of life, but not least to political ethics. We are doing this uh, webinar the day before the US election, where political ethics have been really at the forefront of uh, what has occurred in that campaign. So we have a very distinguished panel uh, to discuss this important issue of uh, political ethics. Uh, Don Gibson is a United Church uh, minister who for many years has led ethical round tables and uh, discussions uh, on the role uh, and contributions that uh, uh, religious uh, faiths have made to uh, ethical uh, discourses. Uh, we have Mary Dawson, a who's had a long time, very distinguished career in the uh, Department of uh, Justice and uh, became the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner of Canada just after the passage of the Conflict of Interest Act. So uh, she has had to be in that uh, critical position of adjudicating uh, a variety of ethical issues that affected parliamentarians and uh, members of the uh, government. And Penny Collinette is uh, a lecturer in law at the University of uh, Ottawa. Um, herself was a senior advisor in the prime minister's uh, office um, and is a columnist with the uh, Toronto Star who has written often and quite passionately about uh, ethics. So I'm delighted to have uh, the panel uh, today, and we look forward to uh, to this discussion. So, uh, Don, I think I'll uh, begin with you. One of our goals in the uh, in, uh, 
uh, ethical series is to uh, begin and discuss uh, somewhat about the framework of ethics. Uh, where do we get our moral principles and how have they uh, affected uh, our uh, lives? Um, the uh, world religions, I, I note, uh, came together in the mid-90s, about 6,000 of them in something called the Parliament of World Religions uh, to pull together a global ethic uh, saying that what united them on ethics was more important than what divided them on other issues. So do we have a common uh, ethic? Well, thank you. Um, actually, we're going to have each of these sessions, someone offer a, a framework from uh, different perspectives, some other religious perspectives, secular and philosophical. So, so today, primarily, I'm going to look at briefly three principles from my own Judeo-Christian background, uh, and also then offer some observations. I want to begin with my mother. My mother, when I was growing up, often said, pointing her finger at me, your behavior matters. I think part of these conversations uh, over the next months are really about that. Uh, does our behavior matter? Uh, does it matter less now than it used to? But let me begin with an affirmation. And that is uh, with most world religions, uh, philosophical, secular perspectives, there are common truths uh, about ethics that we hold in common. But let me begin with one principle, and that's the Ten Commandments. You may recall a number of years ago, there was a, a U.S. judge, I think in the southern states, who was all fired up about wanting the Ten Commandments on the wall of his courtroom. He was interviewed uh, one evening on television. And you may have had this kind of experience when you're exasperated uh, at something you're hearing on television. I found myself talking at the TV screen. In fact, I was probably yelling at it. And I was yelling something like this. Man, forget about the Ten Commandments on the wall. Just do your job. Those Ten Commandments are the framework for most of the law that you're there to uphold. The Ten Commandments have had a significant impact on the ethical and moral norms of our society. You don't have to hang them on a wall uh, to understand that. In a slightly different vein, but I think pertinent, Northrop Fry in The Vocation of Eloquence wrote, the fundamental job of the imagination in ordinary life is to produce out of society we live in a vision of the society we would like to live in. I think in many ways the Ten Commandments are intended to help shape that vision of a world we would want to live in. Much more than rules, much more than the thou shalt's and thou shalt not's. It's a framework for building a society. The biblical narrative, of course, tells the story of the Hebrew people enslaved in Egypt. Moses is called by his God to lead them out of slavery. They spend 40 years, the exodus in the wilderness. The Ten Commandments are set in the midst of this move from slavery to a new society. Slaves who are on the verge of setting up their own society. Moses climbs up Sinai and receives the Ten Commandments. Commandments to shape that new society and clearly commandments that have shaped subsequent societies. Some of those commandments that Moses received focus on individual responsibility and others on the wider collective responsibility. David Opperbeck is a lawyer and a theologian. In his book, Theology and Law, he writes about positive law. It governs our everyday life by balancing the rights we have as individuals with responsibilities we have to one another. That really is the essence of the Ten Commandments, the template of personal and collective responsibilities. The second principle, just very quickly, is sometimes referred to as Jesus' great commandment. When asked to sum up the law, Jesus spoke about loving God and your neighbor as yourself. The law or the ethic in his teaching uh, is connected to relationship. Jesus connects just relationships with ethical, moral living. He taught that you can keep the letter of the law but still not really keep the law if you're not in good and just relations with others. This idea about just relations leads to really that third principle I wanna uh, focus on, and that's justice. Now, I'm a preacher, so you'd expect me to talk a little bit about sin, right? So here we go. What are the biggest sins in the Bible? Just sort of think about that. 
Well, <laughs> over 2,000 times in the biblical text, it is clear that a lack of compassion and justice for the poor, the hungry, the foreigner, the widow, the prisoner, and the list goes on and on, is sinful. 2,000 plus references. You know, all those other seemingly big sin items, they only have a handful, just a few references. Justice for those on the margins is one of the key biblical principles to understanding ethical and moral living. I mean, we could spend a lot of time, uh, but just as an example, uh, the, 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 the great speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. are so uh, steeped in this uh, theme of justice. Or in our own context in Canada, to understand Tommy Douglas and all that he was able to do as a politician, one needs to know much about the social gospel movement and this justice movement that was behind it. Now, these principles, I got to be clear, have not always been lived out. They've often been ignored but they are influential values. Let me just offer a few words of caution. And this, the first one would be imposing values. Once in the promised land, the leadership began to interpret those 10 commandments. When they were done, instead of 10, they had over 600 of them. Uh, they, some of them uh, were helpful. Many of them though imposed a heavy handed ethic on individuals and some supported a particular vision of a society. We see this tendency to impose values over sexuality, abortion, capital punishment in our current society. Imposing values on society is nothing new. But is there an increase in attempts to impose values? What is, uh, who's doing the imposing and to what end? That U.S. judge was attempting to impose a viewpoint, his understanding of a Christian America. I think also coming out of the Ten Commandments is the current challenge about individual versus collective rights. You know, individualism, the meism of our culture. Do codes of responsibility and conduct matter anymore? Do I have to play by the rules? It's a fragile balance between individual and collective responsibilities in our society. Society's response to COVID, as Tom pointed out, uh, is an ongoing test. Finally, just really, really quickly, and I would love to have a lot more time to talk about situational ethics. If we can just assume for much of our certainly Western history, the Ten Commandments were seen as the norm, as the law. But in the 20th century, uh, those absolute norms began to be questioned. And what came on the scene was a situational understanding, taking into account the particular context of an act rather than judging it according to absolute moral standards. Context and situation combined with an understanding of the law. I welcome uh, that, but I think it requires diligence to ensure the shift serves that common good. An interesting uh, shift ethically, morally, that we've just been witnessing was when the Pope spoke in favor of same-sex unions and the right to have families. Now, he's not gone as far as offering a religious blessing, but still is a dramatic shift from what has been absolute values, situation and context. Right and wrong are perhaps not so easily definable. I preached a sermon not long ago on the Ten Commandments, and I entitled it, Right, Wrong, Maybe. I'll give my mother the last word. How you behave yourself matters. Let's find out if it matters in the world of politics. Well, thank you, Don. And uh, we'll turn to uh, Mary now. Uh, Don uh, mentioned, Mary, that the role of uh, codes and, uh, and uh, ethical frameworks. Um, and you had the important responsibility of, of uh, being the, ethic, the ethics commissioner of uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, the application of, of ethics to political leaders and legislators has been debated for a very long time. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in administering such code and, uh, and trying to have our legislators and our ministers adhere to it? Yes. Um, as conflict of interest uh, and ethics commissioner, I was an officer of parliament and administered two regimes, actually, the conflict of interest code for members of the House of Commons and the conflict of interest act. The act applies to public office holders defined um, 
to include primarily ministers, ministerial staff, parliamentary secretaries, and most governor and council appointees, including deputy ministers. So it reaches into the public service just at the highest level. Uh, and uh, ministers, uh, of course, are under both the code and the act. The rules under these two regimes are similar, but the member's code is shorter than the act and does not include some of the measures required under the act that are aimed at avoiding conflicts of interest, like establishing blind trusts or prohibiting outside employment, for example. Nor does the code establish any post-employment rules. The development of ethics regimes for politicians and political appointees is fairly recent. They were spurred on by various scandals, such as the Watergate affair in the United States, and uh, in Canada, the Airbus affair in the 80s, and the sponsorship scandal in the 90s. As the conflict of interest regimes developed in Canada, the processes have become more and more comprehensive and the rules more specific. In addition, they have evolved from advisors who simply provide private advice to independent commissioners who can launch formal investigations and issue public reports. Furthermore, the independence of their office has been ensured by moving them out of government departments. The provinces and territories have similar re regimes to that in Canada. Uh, I note that the Canadian conflict of interest regimes are very well regarded internationally. When I was commissioner, I received many international visitors uh, from foreign governments um, wishing to study our system. Our conflict of interest rules cover a limited range of ethical issues, focusing specifically on issues of fairness in the application of political or government authority or power. They relate generally to taking advantage of one's position to benefit oneself, one's family or friends, or as in, case of the, in the case of gifts, accepting benefits that could reasonably be, reasonably be seen to have been given to influence the recipient in the exercise of his duties. They do not cover the much broader range of ethical lapses, such as lying, cheating, disregarding the needs or feelings of others. At the other extreme, they do not cover criminal behavior, which has stronger mm -hmm. sanctions. In fact, in relation to criminal matters, the commissioner must mm -hmm. suspend an investigation if a criminal charge is laid, or must refer to the appropriate authorities if he or she believes that a criminal offense has been committed uh, while investigating something under the uh, act or code. While the specific provisions of the act and the members code are important, the processes established around them are at least equally important. Public office holders and members must on appointment or election disclose to the commissioner detailed information about their financial situation uh, and their business interests, their outside activities, and must keep this information up to date. Uh, they, dis they must also disclose gifts received that are worth over $200 and offers of employment as they occur. All these reporting requirements allow the commissioner's office to engage directly with public office holders or members, answer questions, provide advice, and in the case of public office holders, establish compliance measures such as blind trusts and conflict of interest screens. In addition to advice given on a personal basis, numerous guidelines have been made available and educational systems are offered to various groups. The Conflict of Interest Act includes a definition of conflict of interest, but it provides no definition of private interests, a concept that's uh, central to that definition. In determining as commissioner what interests were intended to be covered as private interests, I concluded that they must be related to the type of information that is required to be disclosed by public office holders, namely financial type interests, and not necessarily one's reputation or to political interests. I have said, however, on a number of occasions that there should be as well a separate code to, seek, to oversee the carrying out of political interests. The Act covers situations when the private interests of public office holders and their families are furthered, but also covers situations where the private interests of friends are furthered or the private interests of any other person are improperly furthered. Neither the word friend nor the word improperly is defined, so the definition is similarly left to the commissioner, uh, which I've developed uh, over the years, developed a number of uh, indices there for those two. Uh, one final comment on the definition of conflict of interest. 
It expressly includes situations that merely provide an opportunity to further private interests, regardless of the motive of the public, of the public office holder, and even if no interest is actually furthered. This makes it necessary for public office holders to consider the optics of a situation regardless of their motivations. Mm -hmm. Now a few words about formal in in investigations. They're called mm -hmm. examinations under the Act and inquiries under the Code, uh, Member's Code. They can be initiated on reasonable grounds on the request of a member of the House of Commons or a senator, or they can be self-initiated by the Commissioner. The standard of proof is not that of criminal law, beyond a reasonable doubt, but a balance of probabilities, as is the standard in civil law cases. Hearings are held in private and a record is kept by a court reporter. The commissioner has the power of a court to enforce the attendance of witnesses and to compel them to give evidence. And that's a power I never had to resort to, in fact. Uh, I didn't have trouble with uh, the witnesses. There's no appeal from the uh, commissioner's decisions except for judicial review by the federal court relating to jurisdiction or procedural fairness. Uh, and there hasn't been one found against the office either, and although there have been several taken. Uh, as a final comment, I have found, I have made many recommendations for changes to the act and the member's code, some of which in the member's ca code case have already been made but generally, I believe that our system is working well. I also have found that members and public office holders are generally supportive of the office and that they appreciate the advice received from the office. I do not advocate fines or other punishments for contraventions of the conflict of interest rules. I think that the public report is sufficient, along with any result that the entity responsible for the public office holder, or in the case of a member, the House of Commons, uh, or the general public for that matter, uh, might wish to pursue. The only penalties provided for now are the administrative monetary penalties in the Act, and those are for failures to meet uh, reporting deadlines. Now, I could have gone, gone on forever in, on this subject, but I am stopping now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Penny, uh, you, you wrote an article recently in The Star. We've heard from colleagues about one of the frameworks or pillars of our ethical system, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and latterly the acts that are administered by uh, Canada. Um, and you wrote this summer that you believe that ethics should be at the top of the cabinet agenda. Now, do you think that has happened? And what, why do you think that is so? Hmm. Thank you, Tom, and it's a pleasure to be here. I um, I did write that article because I was very frustrated, I'll have to tell you. Um, I was watching the, the we controversy go on this summer, and I was thinking of all the other important things we had to do, and, and why were we now in 2020 discussing ethics again? I've been on this wicket for, <laughs> I think, since 2002 when I was at the Kennedy School and uh, Enron fell apart. And so ethics was a, a big concern for me then and I've been researching it. And you know, you want to see improvement, you want to see progress. And I'm not sure that we are. I, I have huge respect for Mary and normally we agree on things, but I'm not sure that I'm quite as positive as she is about um, our ethical regime, our institutions and, and our values. And there's four reasons for that. Um, and I'll, I'll give you my takeaway right now. My takeaway is that we have to do better. That Canada has to up its ethical game. And I don't think we have a lot of time to lose on it. The number one reason is something, Tom, that you referred to at the beginning, and that was the, um, the Trump administration in the States. How much does that affect us? Well, it affects us in, in ways that um, <laughs> I think we're, we're slowly grappling with. We've been horrified. We've been shocked at the fact that independent institutions are to be interfered with. We've been shocked that laws have been broken. Um, and all of this trickles down. You know, ethics doesn't have borders. It, it, it seeps in. And if we have another four years tomorrow night, uh, I think it gives us it must give us a very good opportunity to strengthen our own institutions and to do it now. 
The second reason is that um, in the last 10 years, I added this up and it, it quite bothers me. So in a decade, we've had four public commissions on wrongdoing in the public sector. And I find four public commissions that are a lot of money and a lot of time and take a lot of resources, maybe too many in a decade. Mary referred to the Airbus um, Commission, uh, the uh, uh, Oliphant Commission, which concerned um, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. And I might add these commissions are all of different governments and different political stripes. Uh, the second one was the Gomery Commission, and Mary referred to that as a sponsorship scandal uh, when Mr. Krejcian was the Prime Minister. Um, the third one was the Charbonneau Commission in Quebec, which looked very strongly and very frightening, I must say, into organized crime in the public, in uh, the construction industry. And right now, here we are in 2020, kind of fixed on Trump, but out in BC, we have another incredibly important commission going on right now, the Cullen Commission, which is looking at, it had, had a hiatus where the, um, while the election was on, but it's back now. And it's looking into money laundering in uh, a number of areas in BC, uh, casinos, gaming, um, real estate, and uh, a couple of professional sectors. So I find that for public commissions in a decade, into wrongdoing in the public sector in a decade is, is too many. And when I think about all the other things we could have done with that money, um, it sort of, it makes you a bit frustrated. My third point, so we've got Trump, we've got commissions. Um, my third point is that last week, or maybe in the week before, Transparency International, which is an um, organization which tracks corruption, um, listed Canada as the least, the least corrupt, the least 12th corrupt country out of 180 countries. So, you know, normally you'd say that's pretty good. We're the least corrupt, or the least 12th corrupt in 180. The only problem was that two years ago we were at six, I think it was six. Um, at any rate, we've dropped a couple of points, uh, which again is slightly concerning. Also in the report, they found that uh, we are about the bottom of the countries when it comes to um, enforcing bribery uh, legislation. That also is a concern to me. And then the fourth point is, is the we controversy this summer and, and frankly a, a pattern of ethical concerns um, since tw uh, 2015. Each government has them, don't get me wrong. And there'd probably be something wrong if we didn't have some some questions and concerns because we need to get them out but the we controversy um not only involved cabinet governance and the machinery of government but it also had a, a blindsiding effect on civil society and young people and students and so we don't want to see that kind of thing happen again i don't want to go into the the details of it unless there's questions everybody's got their own opinion on it but the point is we've had these uproars and we've had them too often, I think, in a decade. And so that's why I say it's it's time for us to up our game. And I think this is a great opportunity to do it. Well, thank you, Penny. I'd like to go into um, a second round with the uh, with the uh, panel, um, which is that the application of ethics to political leaders. Um, Machiavelli uh, said, for example, that famously said that the end justifies the, uh, the means and, and that uh, the ultimate resolution of a policy uh, for the good of the state, uh, one should not look at the means that, that were necessary to get there. So that, that strikes me as a, as a fundamental ethical issue that can ethics be uh, applied to politicians in particular? Is there something different about the political realm as opposed to other realms that should give them more leeway? Uh, Don, can I, can I start with you on that? How does that question fit into the framework you just described to us? 
I, I'm, I think clearly it's one of the most significant challenges. Um, I think political leaders are, you know, have two things going on. One of obviously is their own particular, I'm going to use the word moral compass. So wherever it is they are in, in terms of understanding of ethics, but they also, uh, as part of their work, uh, they are, you know, they have so many other people trying to impose uh, their values on them so that they will then ensure that their values are heard rather than others. It's a very, very challenging uh, situation to be in. Uh, I think that uh, for, any leader, uh, it's tempting at times to find um, the the easiest route, uh, to find the the road that seems the the most straightforward, and the ends justifying the means certainly uh, is often that. Um, I think there have been cases, obviously, in in in, in history where uh, it's been necessary. Uh, I think, though, it's a the whole concept of ends justifying the means uh, it, it is very concerning because it uh, it, it tempts to uh, not have us focusing on where we stand in terms of our own ethical world. And I think we have to, uh, part of uh, what Peggy was talking about, about, you know, this is a good opportunity. This is an opportunity for us, I think, uh, for ourselves individually, but for our, also of our expectation of our leaders to examine uh, each of us, uh, our own kind of moral compass and how we, what our understanding about ethics. And so I hear you about the ends justifying the means. It makes me really nervous uh, that we can set aside kind of moral ethical framework to accomplish something. Uh, Penny, on, <clears throat> on the point that, that uh, you raised, that you think there are really significant uh, uh, ethical issues uh, that are um, occupying uh, Canadians uh, today in public policy, uh, you and I have both spent time with political parties and in the party uh, system, mm. and and uh, and we we talked about how conventions and and uh, ethical rules sometimes are bent and certainly in the United States are being uh, broken. Is there something about partisanship, about the competitive nature of politics? That has grown so overwhelmingly um, that that ethical norms are more easily discarded than they were in the past. Is it in the nature of polling, the deep analytics? I'm I'm interested in your take on parties today in the 21st century and and ethics. What's happening there? Well, I'm glad you raised parties, Tom, because I didn't think we get to them. And I do think that a lot of responsibility um, should be on the shoulders of parties. And I, I don't think we do that enough. That's that's where everything starts, right? That's where we get our candidates. It's where we get our leaders. And it is where we get our ethics in politics. And if you have a party that is saying, look, we got to win this election. We don't care what it takes. Oh, there's rules about money. We'll spend more money than we've got, you know and we've seen parties do this, um, then that's how we learn. That's how our young people who are getting into politics learn. Oh, we did that in the campaign, big deal. Or, you know, a, a person is working for a candidate, that candidate becomes a minister, but during the campaign and the riding, that candidate said, go ahead, take down their, the, the opponent's signs, or, you know, do something awful. I mean, the parties, have got to be a lot more transparent about their own ethics and their own values. I know parties want to be self-regulated. I know they don't like to be interfered with, but honestly, that is where it starts. And if, if we could have good ethical training there that then carries on to government or opposition, whatever the party um, wins, I think it would be really, um, it would be a really positive thing. And, and it, you know, we talk about tone from the top. How often do we hear our political leaders talk positively about ethics? Somebody in our opposition will say, well, that my opponent isn't ethical. But when have we ever heard a political leader in this country actually devote a speech to ethics, to values, to norms? We never do. And it's not their fault. I know they've got a million things to do, but that's what I'm saying. This is maybe the perfect time now as we look at what's happened in the United States and as we start to worry about our own country, that we start to talk about this, that we start to put ethics at the top of the cabinet agenda. 
Um, Mary, uh, a question uh, uh, for you and, and perhaps other members of the panelists can comment on this. Of course, one of the issues is that we want ethical standards and conflict of interest and so on. But is it also not fair to say that the men and women who enter political life um, in exchange for being members of parliament or ministers, they also then have to give up a, a lot of things in terms of their privacy, uh, things like their tax returns, or they have to put their, their finances into blind trusts and so on. Um, that, that, that we are, it, is it fair to say that with all the other difficulties of entering, entering political life, we are subjecting them to uh, this ethical prism, which is made public, and and uh, is 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 this a, a major? Do you think in any way a deterrent on people uh, going into politics? Oh, I'm sure it does deter some people from going into politics, but uh, I think they are essential um, uh, guidelines to put around uh, the behavior of politicians. They're what allow us to um, to oversee them. In fact, uh, uh, and uh, so I think that uh, um, I, I, you know I recognize that uh, politicians give up a lot uh, of their personal life, but um, they do it because they feel it's a good thing to do. You know, there's a clash of various ethical values that that occur in the situation of political uh, situations. Um, you know, I, if one case I just loved uh, was the, I, I just mentioned it because I think it's kind of relevant, um, is the checks report, which I did, oh, must be about five years ago or something. Uh, and it was, uh, there was a hue and cry because the, um, one of the parties was putting out, when they, when they made um, uh, funds available to various people, when they had a big celebration putting it out, they'd be up on a stage with an enormous check which said the Conservative Party of Canada, not the government of Canada. And, um, you know, this this came, 63 complaints came into my office and I had to uh, do a report on that. And um, in the report, interestingly enough, I found that the, it really wasn't covered by the legislation, but it was a, not a good thing to be done. And, you know, even with that report, uh, finding that there wasn't a contravention, that practice stopped. And so I think these reports and the fact that things are looked at carefully um, are, is the most important aspect of the, of the um, conflict of interest schemes. Because even if, and, and with this business about um, difficulty in balancing the greater goods that somebody thinks to breaching some ethical breach, um, the, the, those things get looked at when there's a system in place and um, the breach is highlighted. And I think, uh, uh, you know, maybe people falter too far uh, on many occasions, but um, it's very important to call it out and to, uh, and quite often um, amendments are made or changes are made as a result of particular cases. So, um, you know, it's a kind of a no win problem, uh, but uh, it's one we always have to grapple with, and we do have some procedures uh, with which to work. Good, thank you. Well, uh, we are having some uh, questions starting to come through the uh, the uh, chat boxes, so uh, let's let's ask uh, Matt if he could put up some of the uh, questions that we've uh, received. Okay, uh, uh, from Akash. Um, <laughs> Hmm. Well, okay. ah. So mm -hmm. let's start with you, uh, uh, Don, if I can throw that one to you. Uh, you mentioned in, in your discussion how often justice is mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the biblical uh, uh, tradition. Uh, have we framed ethics too much around thou shalt not as opposed, as opposed to thou shalt do? I, I, I'm just chuckling because I really like that observation, that question uh, um, that I just saw. 
I, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, um, we've approached uh, codes as, as a, in a legalistic perspective. Uh, and when I talked about uh, Jesus shifting it to the relational aspect, uh, I think that's uh, uh, one of the, the key factors. But I really do think we have to get more positive. Um, the, the greater good, uh, the what's uh, in the wider interest of the of the broader collective community, uh, that's what we need to be talking more about uh, and how individual leaders and political parties, I was intrigued by that uh, point, I think it was a good one, uh, how we contribute in a positive way to build a better society. I think the framework of, of those Ten Commandments are part of that vision of building a better society. So I think we do need to be more positive uh, rather than than the negative. You know, the finger pointing uh, is necessary at times, but really we need to be pointing in the direction where we might, we can go, the possibilities. Good, okay. Uh, the next question. Uh, uh, from Mel Cap, of course, is with uh, head of the Privy Council, and a question for Mary specifically. Uh, if the framework of the act is specific, uh, doesn't it remove the role of judgment in the public office holder? Uh, isn't a generalized framework like the Ten Commandments better? So, Mary, general or specific? <laughs> well, thank you, Mel. <laughs> I yeah. um, uh, I think uh, actually uh, the specific um, the specific provisions of a of a, an act very often are not defined within the act and I talked about a couple of those examples already and they have to be developed and it's kind of like the court system you develop up um, precedents and and come to understand certain areas better I would dispute with the rules being particularly rigid in many cases there there uh, there are examples of things that protections are built around but the rules in general uh, like um, the general conflict of interest rule is really a very broadly written rule. Uh, so um, I think that uh, there is a good focus on the broad principles and uh, one has to develop an understanding of how those would apply as the uh, years go by. A, a, um, here's one from our principal, okay. Uh, so are political parties created to think that the ends justify the means? Ethics is a hindrance instead of a cardinal principle. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. All, all our panelists could talk about that, but let's let's start with uh, with uh, Penny. Yeah, I think that's that's a really important point because the law is certainly the conflict of interest uh, law, and many of the guidances are not there to punish anybody. They're there to protect. The minister and the minister's staff and we just um i think akash's question also was very good that we we do look at it in negative terms and we should perhaps in terms of education be trying to say this in a positive way these are here to protect you um and if you follow them you're not going to get in trouble your minister is not going to get in trouble um i also think though uh to don's point that in his answer to akash that uh one of the problems we have with being positive is not just the opposition, but it's our beloved media who would have a hard time, I won't say a hard time, but are less likely to write about an MP uh, with great integrity than they are to write about an MP who is in trouble. I mean, let's be honest, that's a story and you can't blame them for that. But it would be nice occasionally to have um, Stories about AMPs that are, are, we all know them in every party, we know them. We all know who are the MPs with moral compasses, as you call it, Don, and I do too. And in fact, anybody watching in any workplace, you all know that person too. You know who it is, the one who's discreet and has integrity and that you trust. There's a lot of MPs like that. And yes, I think if we could frame it in a more positive way and frame it so that the 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 laws and the guidances are, are there for protection and not uh, punishment, we'd be a lot better off. Hmm. Well, related to that, uh, you've also talked about, uh, and on, on the principal's point, that there should be specific 
training in ethics or education in ethics for members of political staffs. And I don't know if you mm -hmm. extend that to members of parliament or others. Uh, you and I both spent some time at the Kennedy School and we, we used to run uh, courses there for incoming senators and members of the House of Representatives and members of their staff. Um, I don't think we have anything like that in Canada. I can be corrected. But I don't know of any ethical training for the men and women uh, who become MPs if they haven't had that basis before, and certainly not for their staffs. And the staffs are given a huge amount of power as an, as, a, as an unelected folks in our system. Is that is that a real weakness that we have in our system? Ethical training for decision makers? All members of the panel can comment on that. Who'd yeah, like to I, start? I, I, think, I think it's a real weakness, Tom, and it's something that I've, well, I've been on about for years. Um, two answers to it usually. We don't have the money and we don't have the time. And especially if it's a new government, everybody's just got been elected, everybody's excited, there's 50 million uh, files on everybody's desk. And oh, my God, you want me to go on and talk about ethics? Like, oh, really? You know, I'll learn it. I'll learn it. This should be absolutely a number one priority. The minute any mm -hmm. government, whether they're, it's a new government or whether they're coming back to government, because there are changes in laws, as we know, there are changes in, in morals and values. I mean, we need to be up to date. We need to have it top of mind in the private sector. Um, you know, you sit down with your staff at least once a year and you go over all the compliances. Some people think it's just a check, mm -hmm. but other people actually ask questions, you know. And I, one of the things I, I wondered about during the week controversy is if we couldn't make in each ministry staff someone who is what I would call, and they'll have other duties too, the compliance officer or the ethics officer. It's just somebody on a staff. That um, that's that others could go to just to ask questions because sometimes it's just a matter of confusion. Just Mary, just a quick comment. If I could offer a quick comment on that, um, the uh, if the government doesn't have that in place, uh, it, it's it's shocking. Uh, I mean, in the private sector and so many businesses in the educational world, uh, these things have become quite common practice. Uh, ethical review, uh, compliance, as Peggy was talking about. So uh, I guess uh, to hear and to begin to even think about the fact that our, it's not happening in government, just it, I'm shocked uh, and frankly very concerned. It sounds like a really important matter to be explored. Can I intervene here? I, I, you know, I, much of what I talked about in my introductory remarks related to that, um, there are mechanisms for, you know, the reporting that people had to do. They had to come into my office or at least talk on the phone and have an interview every time they reported some something and there was space for questions. Either myself or members of my office went out to um, various ministerial offices or uh, various uh, commissions and whatnot to talk to the staff about things that were of particular importance. I remember uh, the people looking after uh, admission of, uh, of um, people to Canada, that group, but there was many, many of them. And uh, the other thing is um, I was invited personally to go when the new government was appointed to speak to the new members uh, and uh, gave a presentation on the ethical rules. So it isn't totally overlooked. Um, the, it is being addressed and, and certainly in the office that I used to manage, uh, we did a lot of um, uh, visits to various groups to explain the rules that were particularly relevant for them uh, in, as well yeah. as the general system. So I, I just have to disabuse yeah. um, people a little bit of the of the complaints that nothing is being done. That's what the conflict of interest office was uh, was established in part for. Anyway. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, Bob uh, Weiss, who was a former senior uh, civil servant and public servant in Saskatchewan with uh, Premier Blakely. So. How, uh, I mm -hmm. guess the start, Mary, how, how do the conflict of interest rules relate to the lobbyist registration rules? I, I know you didn't run the lobbyist registration rules, but mm -hmm. is there, is, what are the yeah. other institutions 
beyond your own on the ethical institutions. Actually, we had we, inter we interfaced quite a bit on uh, lobbying issues. Originally, about uh, before my, the act was established, a little bit earlier, uh, lobbying was indeed uh, dealt with by the ethics commissioner as well. It was a joint exercise. Oh, okay. um, also, um, there were several decisions that I made where I, the people phoning me up for further information and discussions were the lobbyists. Um, it is a separate office now. There were occasionally a little bit of confusion because uh, some of the rules established by one office did not say, use the same words but didn't have the same message. Uh, but generally speaking, um, there is uh, those things are very, very closely allied because the lobbyists are the cause of many of the uh, um, infractions under the uh, Conflict of Interest Act. Good. Okay, we're we're starting to come to the end of our time, but but there's a, a one area that's been raised in the discussion, and also in some of the questions, and uh, I'd like to go to all three panelists and get the and give them a chance to comment. Which is, um, what changes, if any, would you then suggest that Canada make in this area of of uh, institutions, practices, or conventions around political ethics. I know, Mary, you said that you didn't think your office needed uh, powers to put on financial penalties or so on. Um, Penny, has, Penny has talked about she thinks we need a more vigorous change uh, suggestions and, and uh, we can hear from Dawn on this well. So what, in a perfect world, if you had a, a chance to bring in changes or suggest changes, and you've made many recommendations, Mary, let's start with you. What next should we be doing on Penny's agenda uh, of looking at ethical issues? Is there something that really stands out for you? I think there's areas, the fundraising rules are quite weak, uh, and I've noted that they need improvement. Uh, education, as I said in my remarks, is, is super important, as Penny says as well, and uh, we are trying. Um, the uh, a little bit more reporting in certain areas, a little bit less reporting in some areas. But for example, uh, uh, post-employment, there's a lot of post-employment rules and there are uh, no reporting requirements. There are some rules, but no reporting requirements. And it's the reporting requirements that bring the uh, enforcer together with, with the people being enforced and or the people that have to follow the rules. And that's where the discussions need to take place before these problems are, are established or happen. Good. Uh, Penny? Uh, well, I think, first of all, tone from the top is, is really important. And as I pointed out, we, we don't talk about it a lot negatively or, or positively. Um, but I, I do think there was a question, and I don't know if it was here or one of my readings about, you know, should politicians be held to a higher standard? And I think, mm -hmm. yes, they should be. Um, they're elected to represent the rest of us. They're, they're making decisions on taxpayers' money. So, yes. And should the prime minister be held to a higher standard than even the ministers? Yes. Um, if, if not, uh, it's hypocritical. So... I think that's very important. I'd like to see more tone from the top, from all ministers, all parties, all the time. Um, Mary's right, there is some training, but Mary, it's usually after the fact. Um, what no. I think what I'm trying to get to is more within no. parties itself. It needs to be uh, really put up the priority list. And it needs to be uh, always transitioned in, not just when there's a problem, um, you know, what we want to do is prevent all this, right? So anything we can do ahead of time is, is really the best. And then I guess um, I, I would come back to looking at ministers' offices and trying to figure out if there's not some way to add a, a certain extra um, duty for someone to, um, to always be on top of the rules, any changes, and to have regular conversations with staff and to find out if there are there issues of concern. And you would hope that culture is an open and encouraging one, not a silent culture. Good. Uh, I, I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I think what we need to do, and the word educational piece has come up a number of, concept, number of times. I think what we have to do is we have to um, 
uh, work much harder at raising the level of the discourse uh, and discussion. Uh, we have to be asking our leaders, how does this serve the greater common good? Does it do that? Uh, to raise those uh, kind of higher standards uh, uh, is to then, you know, hopefully create a climate where uh, they will begin to, to move in that kind of direction. I think it is education. I think it's almost a, a conversion individual by individual, uh, but it's really important to, to broaden the conversation to, to what's in the best interest of society. How do we build that greater good? Uh, raise the bar in the conversation and hopefully uh, uh, we'll, we'll catch up. Uh, we'll move in a little more positive direction. Good. Good. Okay. So that's the, the the last of the questions that we've got on this round. So uh, let me just go back to the panel for any final comments that you would like to make. Uh, Mary, do we want to start with you? Oh, gosh. Well, um, I'm glad to see people are worried about the ethical issues because I think they're important. Uh, there, You know, I've used the expression before, there tends to be in some circumstances blind spots. Uh, people think they're doing the right thing. They're very mm. committed to achieving a, some purpose and they just don't quite see <laughs> what it is mm. they're, they're not complying with. And uh, so again, it's education, education. I, I think uh, uh, every opportunity to, uh, to educate. I, I do mention just in brackets as well, some of the ministerial offices do have people um, assigned to um, the, the connecting on the ethical issues. Just a little bit of comfort. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Penny, final comments. Yeah, I, you know what, I, I don't want Canadians to be cynical about our politics. I think that's, that's where I'm really coming from. I want us to be proud. We are a fantastic country. We are. And, you know, I think the last few months have shown everybody that all the, all the major political parties and leaders care about the safety and the health of Canadians. That's clearly number one. And they're, they're fighting hard for that. But I want us to be even better. I guess I'm, I'm very ambitious for this country. I don't want us going down any slippery slope. And I don't want us to just uh, feel that we're okay and we don't have to worry about this. I think we do. We've seen it to the neighbors south of us. Can't have it here. And um, there's a lot of practical suggestions today that have come up. And I just hope that that's carried forward because at the end of the day, we want Canadians to trust in our governments, whatever stripe it is, whatever partisanship it is. We want that trust. We need it to have a healthy democracy. Mm. I would just I would just comment a little bit more, Penny. Thank you for your comment about cynicism. I, I really think you're right. I think we become quite cynical uh, as a people, and I would tie that to an earlier point someone made. Uh, let's hear those good stories. Uh, you know, find ways uh, uh, to hear those people who are really acting in good ethical moral standing. Uh, let's get those stories out there. Uh, there's nothing more positive uh, than a good news story. And yet, as you said, the media wants to carry the, the bad news sells. Well, let's try to sell the good news. Uh, let's lift up those <laughs> examples of good, solid folk who are really trying to build a, a good society. Good. Well, thank you all for a very interesting discussion. Uh, we're very much in your debt. And uh, for the audience, um, this is the first in a series that we are uh, planning. Um, I mentioned uh, in my intro remarks that there was a parliament of religions which talked about global ethics and they had specific sections required for political leaders and parties, for mass communication and for personal responsibilities. And over the next months, we're going to address uh, all of those. Our next session will be on international relations and whether it's possible to have a ethical foreign policy. We'll follow that up with a discussion of ethics during COVID and uh, a host of those issues, everything from wearing uh, masks to the trade-offs that there are between closing businesses and public health. We're debating those almost every day in our newspapers now. And then 
others have mentioned it on this panel already, uh, the role of media, uh, the role of social media, what particular responsibilities do should they carry, just as we've talked about the particular responsibilities that uh, politicians and uh, office holders should hold, what are their ethical responsibilities in those uh, giant social media and mass media uh, empires, and are they fulfilling it? So this has been an excellent start to very important discussions, and be well, and be ethical. Thank you very much. <laughs>